Hi everyone, today I want to share a little bit about a, um, an intern opening that we have here at Twig to work on GHC. So this is something I'm really excited about um, and uh, there's a blog post that I made about it last week. There's a link in the in the video description uh, and I want to go through it and sort of explain some of what's going on here because I think even if you're not looking for a job this is going to be interesting. It's all about performance tuning, um, something I don't often talk about as much. Um, but um, there's lots and lots of ways. So the, the, the point of the internship is is uh, for the intern to improve the performance of GHC. Compile times are, are, are long, right? GHC always seems a bit slow. It's, it's always embarrassing. Every now and then I have to install OCaml and I think OCaml, the entire thing builds in something like five minutes. And when I do that with GHC, it takes 45 minutes. And, and this is just very frustrating. Um, so this is an attempt to try to improve this uh, a, a little bit. And, and so, um, yes, this is a job opportunity. The intern uh, would work directly with me at Twig. It's a remote position. Um, uh, there are other details I can point you to. Uh, but, but this video is really going to be about the different opportunities that the intern will explore to uh, do performance improvement. So let's, let's sort of start walking through these. Um, so, uh, so, so one is is about data structures. So I wanna I wanna call our attention to a particular type in GHC. Um, so let's see. I wanna look at the type type. Um, so we do a search. Oh, there's lots of things like this, but this is the one I'm looking for. Um, and so this is actually the data type within GHC that describes what types are. Um, and so one interesting constructor here is Tykonap. So this is something like int is a tycon app, um, where the int, it's, which is the int tycon applied to no arguments. Um, but either int bool is also a tycon app. It's the either tycon applied to int and bool arguments. Um, but the real question is, why are we storing these arguments as a list? Do we really want the algorithmic properties of a linked list, right? Um, those of you maybe less familiar with, with how Haskell actually works under the hood, these lists, these are really just the same as linked lists as you might see in, you know, C or Java or something like that, right? It, that's how, it, that's the structure. So, so is that the right structure for our usage? Well, sometimes we, we add things to the end of the list, but actually linked lists are terrible at that. Um, Rarely do we add something from the beginning of the list, but we do often iterate from it left to right, so maybe that's good. I don't really know, but we should look at this. We shouldn't just assume that lists are the best just because I can write them with cute brackets, right? So um, so this is this is a problem, right? We, we need to examine this assumption. And this is just one place, but there's many, many places in GHC that use lists. Are these really the thing? Is that really what we should be doing? I don't know. Um, so that's that's data structures. Maybe we can we can come up with something better. Um, so relatedly, fusion. So the way that fusion works in GHC, maybe you've heard of this. So so GHC supports something called rewrite rules, um, which allow you to to write a um, a rule that replaces one uh, one chunk of code with another. So let's let's find an example of this. So I'm going to look for rules in the base library. There's going to be a ton. I expect um, and word ba oh list these are going to be these are going to be good um, okay so let's find some good rules here iterate repeat um, is there any one that's really obvious mm, no I probably should have figured this out beforehand oh well um, let's 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 take a look at this one so here's a way of expanding take to using build so internally uh, build is a function that that is designed to work really well with these rewrite rules and so the idea is that if you have a map of a filter of a fold of a well skip skip the fold a map of a filter of a take uh, right we could probably do that more efficiently than rebuilding the intermediate lists so the idea of fusion is is that a uh, GHC can transform your initial expression which is a map and a filter and a, and a take into something um, more efficient so that's great, but it really only works when you've written out these rules, as we've done in the base library. But GHC internally does a lot more. So if we look in, in utils here, um, so I think misc, there's a whole bunch of other things. So like unzip with. Here's something that operates on lists. This should probably participate in Fusion. Does it? If it inlines, I suppose it would, but can I guarantee that it inlines? There's no inline pragma here. I don't know, but there's a lot of actual, uh, there's, there's, there's actually a lot of functions in this file and elsewhere in GHC, which do, do fairly basic manipulations. Maybe they fuse, maybe they don't. I don't know. 
we have, we need to investigate, and there might be major speed boosts that we can find by investigating this. Um, so case of known constructor, right? This is a case. This is the case where if I say in in some code, um, let's just go into my scratch buffer here. If I have something like case just five of of this, right? Um, I should hope that GHC is clever enough to just to not actually make a comparison, but instead just jump to this code here. And it is. This is case of known constructor. Um, and it looks funny. Who would ever write code like this? Well, we probably wouldn't. But maybe this just five came about by inlining some function and the result of other optimization. So this is actually a really important optimization. Um, so this is really effective when we're calling a function that returns a maybe of something. Um, but there's still limits to how far it can go. Um, in particular, if we have a recursive function that, that returns a maybe, well, we can't inline recursive functions, so we may not be able to get this case of known constructor to trigger in exactly the way that we want it to. And, and so maybe we end up building up lots of just nodes as we're working through a recursive function. And I've seen this in practice a few times. There's also the possibility um, of not just just nodes, but other things. So let me just scroll through this quickly and we can find, oh, can we find something good here? Ah, here we go. So here, now this is a function that, that's returning maybe of a pair. But now when we produce this result, not only do we have to make a just node much of the time, um, but we also have to make the pair node for the pair. And really, we don't care about that, that pair node. We're never going to be using sort of its extra little bit of laziness. We just sort of want to inline this. And so maybe it would make sense to have a maybe two type that, that the just node or just two contains two pieces of data instead of just one. And now we've, we've eliminated a box. So even if we can't do case of known constructor, we can still eliminate the box. This would be a fairly simple syntactic uh, pass through the code base, but it might get some speed. So this is something that the intern could explore. Um, so laziness. So let's go back to that first type um, that we have here. So not only is this a list, but it's a lazy list. It's a lazy list that's lazily stored in the constructor. Um, do we want all of that laziness? I don't know. I don't tend to think so. Um, so it's possible that by making something stricter, we can actually make GHC run a little bit faster. Um, so that might be cool. Um, either by using strict data structures or having strict annotations in existing data structures. Uh, so this is something to look at. Um, so unboxed types. Um, again, if we go back to this, this example here, here is a tuple right now. Of course, a pair is a lazy data structure, which means that maybe it's going to be undefined. But in practice, it's, it's never really going to be. So maybe we don't want a tuple here. Um, maybe even this return tuple from simple bind pair, maybe we don't want that to be a tuple. Maybe that should be an unboxed tuple, which doesn't cause any allocation at all uh, when we create it. And so um, you know, here in the simplifier, this actually is probably called quite a lot in GHC. I wonder what would happen if we just turned this into an unboxed pair. Would that reduce allocations? I don't know. We would have to try. Um, GHC does do optimizations to try to turn box things into unbox ones, so maybe it wouldn't make a difference because GHC is already on top of it. Um, so data representation, so this is another way of thinking of it. So here, I'll just use the example right in the blog post. We, in an expression, I showed Tycon app, that's in types. In expressions, um, in core, if we have nested application, we store a nested application as something like this with nested app nodes. Um, but maybe instead of having nested app nodes, we really want something like this, where we have one app node and then some kind of list structure. Is it built in list or some other list? I don't know. Um, to store the argument. Maybe that would be faster in practice. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but there's many places in GHC where, well, someone just programmed it one way because that was convenient at the time. Um, but we haven't necessarily gone back to examine this and find the best way to store something. Um, so next, algorithms. All right. So. It, it, many times we have a lot of different combinators. So again, I'm going to use the example right here in the blog post. Say um, uh, I have an expression and I want to find whether or not there are any free type variables in the expression. Right? Type variables is distinct from a term variable. So this is very easy using functions that already exist within GHC. So I can get the free variables of the expression. That, there's a good function for that. Then I have a set of variables. Excuse me. So we can iterate through that set of variables. Oh dear, there's a typo. Um, we can iterate through that set of variables 
There's another function for that about sets. And then as we're iterating through, we can detect if there are type variables. So we can get the behavior we want, are there type free type variables in this expression, quite easily just by composing a, a few existing operations. But actually, this is ridiculous, right? This means we have to allocate this set of variables, potentially large, just to iterate through it and to produce a bool? No, 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 no. Instead, we should have some custom function that does this. And so we can look for other places in GHC that we're producing these data structures that we then immediately throw away. And maybe there's a faster way of doing it all. Um, heap profiling. Um, so um, here we can go through and, and GHC has features that we can actually view what is being allocated in the heap and, and when and how long these structures are, are, are existing. So have we ever really sat down and systematically looked at a bunch of heap profiles looking for strange things that we don't expect? Um, there's been quite a lot of heap profiling this done, so maybe we've done this. We, I'd, I'd want to do a little bit more search on prior art, but um, I do think that there's something to be gained here because every now and then when I'm, when I'm working, I see, oh, gee, that's odd. Why are there a whole bunch of con cells? I don't see why we need that. Um, and then we can learn something and, and maybe uh, find uh, an optimization to perform. So, so GHC has a not very well-known feature called Ticky Ticky Profiling, which actually allows us to generate um, uh, detailed information of, of function calls as they happen. Um, and so here, let's follow this link. Um, so here is a recent profile. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger. So this shows us what functions are called um, as uh, as GHC is running. So it was compiling one particular file. The de that those details aren't important, but we can see here actually what it's doing. So there's a ton of time. There's a ton of of, of calls and allocations performed by um, inserting into an int map. Eh, that kind of makes sense. Compilers have to have maps that look at variables, but but that's a, that's a lot. And so actually. As I'm looking at this, I realize that free variable sets, these are, I think, stored internally as int maps. So maybe this is the, the free variable set that we keep creating to see if there are any free type variables in an expression. It could very well be. But what's even scarier is a line like this one. This line is very scary. So if we if we do a little poking around, we see that the, that dollar sign w len ack is the accumulator loop inside of the length function in in for lists. So that means that over the course of this run of GHC, there were three hundred and twenty one thousand list nodes that were counted. Now. Usually, when you're having to find, if you have to find the length of a linked list, you shouldn't be using a linked a linked list. Um, there are exceptions, of course, but the fact that we've had to count 321,000 linked list nodes over the course of, of running GHC, that's very suspicious. So I would want to learn a little bit more about why we needed to do that here. So I think there's actually, and then here, plus, 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 plus is very inefficient because it has to copy the whole first list. Why are we, why are we running plus, plus 221,000? times that's, that's something's very suspicious here um, so another thing to look at so this would be this would be something to, to look into um, so streams so uh, uh, some years ago there was a change made to our uh, to one of our passes to make it run in constant space and this is fantastic using using streams can we take this idea and spread it further within GHC um, yet another opportunity for improvement um, so these are just some ideas. Of course, if you've been watching this long, you could think, well, gee, these aren't specific to GHC. So, so you know, I can identify these problems in GHC, but your Haskell program probably has some of these problems too. Um, and so this may give us some ideas of maybe new tools and new techniques and new blog posts um, uh, uh, to further explore this and do better performance tuning. Um, so this is actually a job, a, a job opening. Um, closing date is, I think, March 4th, if I remember correctly. I'll be reviewing applications uh, soon after that, and then, and then we hope to make a selection. Uh, the intern can start pretty soon thereafter if, if you want, or maybe in the summertime. I don't, I don't think we'd want to wait much longer than that, but, but maybe we can, we can always negotiate something if, if, depending on your availability. Um, so I would love for you to apply. One, one quick note, so there's, there's a, a link to an application. There's some other things in the, in the blog post that you can find in your own time. But um, our, our, our application also links to our pay scale, which has been linked to Google Summer of Code pay scale. Um, it turns out like two months ago, Google Summer of Code has shortened and decreased their pay scale. So we really mean it to be the old Google Summer of Code pay scale, which is based on a, a for, for someone working in the US, it would be a $6,000 uh, uh, 
uh, payment. Um, right now, if you go to Google Summer of Code, it says $3,000. We need to fix this, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. But do know that if you take the numbers on the Google Summer of Code, uh, multiply by two. Um, anyway, I do hope to, to, to see lots of fun applications, and I hope that this has been helpful in perhaps um, optimizing your own Haskell applications. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.